Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on the agenda this morning. CPSC staff will brief the commission on the FY 2018 mid-year review and proposed operating plan adjustments. After staff's presentation is completed, pursuant to our decision-making procedures, the commissioners will be recognized in order of seniority to ask questions for staff responses. Each commissioner will have up to 10 minutes for questions and staff responses, and we will go multiple rounds if needed. The CPSC staff here this morning uh, who will assist us in the briefing are Ms. Patricia Adkins, our Executive Director, Mr. Dwayne Ray, Deputy Execu Executive Director for Safety Operations, Ms. Monica Summit, Deputy Executive Director for Operations Support, and Mr. Jay Hoffman, the Director of our Office of Financial Management. Good morning and thank you to all of you for being here and to everyone behind the scenes who worked on this package and who have um, done many pre-briefings in order to prepare for this briefing. Um, <clears throat> we will now begin with st the staff briefing. Ms. Adkins, if you would like to go ahead, please. Thank you. Good morning to the Commission. Um, as far as the briefing on uh, using the PowerPoint, uh, Monica Summit is going to do the overview, and then Jay Hoffman will follow up with the recommendations. So, Monica? Good morning. Thank you, Patricia. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, as an update or an overview of the mid-year process, the Commission approved the fiscal year 2018 operating plan in October 23rd, uh, 2017, uh, which was premised with the, finance, with the uh, fiscal year budget that was presented to the President that year. Um, since then, the agency has operated under six continuing resolutions. Um, through March 23rd of this year. Um, Congress then enacted the full year appropriation uh, on March 24, 2018 of this year and, uh, at the level of $126 million, $3 million more than the President's budget request. The Commission decision on the fiscal year 2018 mid-year review will um, amend the fiscal year 2018 operating plan. As part of the mid-year review process, there are three staff recommendations. The first recommendation from staff is to align the fiscal year 2018 operating plan with the fiscal year 2018 enacted appropriation level. The second recommendation from staff is to um, authorize authorized projects to, to fund from unexecuted balances, if available. And the final recommendation from staff is to update fiscal year 2018 mandatory st standard activities, voluntary standard activities, and select operating plan performance measures and milestones. And now to uh, talk to in more detail on the recommendations, I'll ask Jay Hoffman to do that. Okay, very good. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to walk through some of these numbers just in detail. Uh, the first recommendation, as Monica mentioned, is to align the FY 2018 operating plan with the enacted level from the appropriation. Uh, as you recall, the FY 2018 operating plan um, uh, was changed from the FY 2017 enacted level. We'd received $126 million in 17 and had gone in with a request of 118, uh, excuse me, $123 million. Uh, Table 1 on your FY 2018 operating plan described the necessary changes. Uh, they, there were two. One was the elimination of funding for the VGB grant program, and the second were um, a net set of unspecified reductions to our salaried expense account to uh, account for the lower target as well as to adjust for inflationary increases. Now, the FY 2018 enacted appropriation level was actually $126 million, which was flat from FY 2017. And uh, the appropriation did two things. Uh, one, it restored $1.1 million in VGB grant funding and also provided $1.9 million in unspecified salary and expense funds. Uh, what we're proposing to do, so this technically adjusts the table two in your operating plan to match those numbers, the $1.9 million in unspecified appropriations will be allocated per recommendation to and any pursuant commission action uh, based on the mid-year uh, decision. 
Okay, so recommendation number two, uh, staff is coming forward asking the commission to authorize projects to fund from our unexecuted balances should they be available. Our current unexecuted balance forecast is $2.1 million. Um, these unexecuted balances generally consist of unspecified increases in appropriations, which I just described, as well as variances in our operating execution, such things as staffing differences or, or operating budgets uh, that are executed slightly different than plan. Staff has identified about $5 million in currently unfunded projects, uh, and we've listed them in priority order for your consideration. Uh, we've listed them in two tiers. Uh, the first tier totals approximately $2.1 million, which is in, within the uh, forecasted range, and so highly probable that those projects would be funded between now and September 30th. Tier two uh, consists of projects that are outside of that $2.1 million range um, and currently are are less likely to be funded by September 30th, but these, these balances tend to change over the summer and will obviously keep you apprised. Uh, if the projects are approved, uh, uh, they will be funded in priority order, subject to availability of funds and procurement uh, slash acquisition feasibility. So here they are. Um, tier one, as I mentioned, totals $2.1 million. The projects are exposure and risk data, portable generators, furniture tip overs, gas appliances, and play yard mattresses. Tier two, totaling approximately $2.9 million, consists of the following projects, lithium ion batteries, import surveillance evaluation of e-commerce requirements, testing for coin cell battery packages, infant and toddler strength measurement, ATV occupant protection, uh, disposable fuel bottles, additional ATV R&D, and pool drowning technology investigation via a proposed challenge.gov initiative. Attachment one, of your mid-year package that was provided in advance of this meeting provides a more detailed description of each of the proposed projects on this table. Uh, recommendation number three is to update the fiscal year 2018 voluntary standard activities and mandatory standard activities as they appear in the FY 2018 operating plan. Staff is proposing revisions to the voluntary standards activities that appear on pages six and seven. Those changes would be the following, to add electric fans and to add gas grills. Staff is proposing new work in these areas. And to delete uh, methylene chloride, as ATM is not pursuing this at this time. Attachment two of the mid-year memo shows the revised FY 2018 voluntary standards table, um, the revisions from the FY 2018 operating plan. Staff is all pro also proposing revisions to the mandatory standards work that appears on pages eight and nine of your FY 2018 operating plan. Those changes are as follows. Uh, the first change is uh, really just a technical uh, adjustment for furniture uh, tip overs. It's listed, uh, it needs to be listed as an AMPR to ac accurately reflect the current status, basically just a calendar update. Uh, the second is to add furnaces, CO sensors as a DATR. So staff is starting work in FY 2018, and this revision is actually consistent with the ANPR as annotated in the FY 2019 President's Budget Request that was submitted to Congress on February 12th. Attachment three of the mid-year memo shows the revised FY 2018 mandatory standards table. Uh, lastly, recommendation number three is to update um, 11 performance measures and milestones that appear in the FY 2018 operating plan. I won't go through each one, but they, they're kind of categorized here. Uh, staff is proposing to adjust the target for four of the uh, performance measures, to replace one measure. We're deleting four measures, and then there's some clarifying uh, adjustments to how the measures are worded for, for a couple. So these changes are described in more detail uh, in attachment four of your, of your mid-year package. So those conclude uh, my remarks. I'm sure you have some questions, so we'll move to that. Thank you very much. At this point, the commission will begin their rounds of questions, and I will begin with the questioning. Um, I'd like to ask um, Mr. Hanway to come up to the table. I want to have a little conversation about, maybe not so little, conversation about NCARES. When the, when the package first came up to me in my office, the number one item on, on in Tier 1 was this NCARES exposure project. And I'd like for you to talk to me and the commission about what this project would provide the commission with that we already don't have. Your speaker. Right. Yeah, thank uh, you. Okay. Um, from time to time, CPSC finds it necessary uh, to obtain information from consumers about the products that they have and use. 
And knowing that this is kind of a recurring need and perhaps even becoming an increasing need as we become uh, more risk-based in terms of our decision-making, uh, we'd like to develop a process for obtaining the information as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, and CARES would allow us to select a set of products, and we would do that with the guidance of the Commission as to what our priorities ought to be, um, and, and seek information about those from a nationally representative set of respondents um, so that we can understand, again, you know, how many people have certain products and how they're using them to help us better gauge uh, the risks that they face. Thank you very much. So the information we would glean from this, and, and my understanding of this is a long-term project, this isn't a one-year project, is that correct? Yeah, our, our anticipation, our desire is that this is something that would become a continuous process, almost like NICE. However, uh, the question in front of you doesn't require you to make that decision about, as to the longevity of the study. This would be just just to get it started and get an initial set of pilot data. Thank you. And. Why would we be better served as an agency to um, to begin this process now instead of waiting for a specific project or a specific rulemaking or voluntary standard? Well, I think if, if we approach these each as individual events, we lose some of the economies of scale and some of the timeliness um, that would be available to us if, if we um, began to recognize that this is something that we may be asking for regularly. So when you combine the recruiting efforts for multiple products, even products that may be very different from one another, um, a, a lot of the cost is borne in just reaching a, a representative set of Americans to get uh, answers about what they use. Uh, but once you've, you've got that uh, interview going, the questions that you ask, um, can be varied in terms of what you do, and that can allow you to do what is the equivalent of multiple studies within a single study. And so in that sense, your kind of cost per product, uh, if you think of the studies in that way, goes down. Also, then there's the timeliness element, because any time you do a new study, you go through the process of designing it, of, of awarding a contract, of um, clearing uh, things with OMB through the Paperwork Reduction Act, um, that adds an extra element of time in terms of how quickly you can get uh, your answers on the back end. So the idea is if you're anticipating this, that you were kind of looking on the horizon of where you'll, you'll, you'll want these kinds of data, um, you uh, can shorten the time frame from when you start asking the questions uh, or, or identify the products that you want to ask about, starting to ask people those questions and then get it, getting the data back to do analysis and, and to be, provide that uh, data to the Commission. Thank you very much. Those, those are the questions I have for this round. Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much. And again, I want to thank staff for uh, what I think is an extremely readable and substantive and very useful document. It's, it's just a delight to read. And it once again renews my incredible respect and faith in our staff. And if I might, Steve, I want to congratulate you for finally getting your SES designation. I know it was a long slog and well, well worth it, so congratulations to you. So uh, back to the questions that uh, Chairman uh, Burkle was asking, and I guess as a starting point, it's not that I think it's necessarily a bad idea, it's just where I think I would prioritize it. And I think a lot of it depends on the word we use to describe what we're doing. And you used the word necessary, I would use the word it's nice. <laughs> it would be nice to know, I don't know that a lot of this data is essential to know, if we are starting out with nice data and death certificates and we've got good market surveys and we've got good uh, industry data, uh, this then gets into the sort of thing where it, it's extremely useful, it would be helpful, it's just a question of choosing between some priorities and the others. But that said, let me uh, ask a couple questions. And, and by the way, thank you for coming by and briefing me on this. You took uh, care of a lot of my questions. But the one thing I, or one of the couple things I forgot to ask is, um, what's the useful life of this instrument? Is this something that we think the actual instrument, the template, not each exposure study, but do you have any sense of the longevity of this? Is this a 10-year thing? Is this a forever thing? It could potentially be a forever thing if this became a, a common way that we examined exposure. 
Uh, and if we commonly found that we had needs like these to keep going with it, it's, it's hard to look in the eyes and know what our budget will always be, what our priorities will always be. But certainly in our world, we can certainly imagine this being a, <coughs> a frequent and common component of what we do. And so you've got two things. You've got the template that we would use, and I think that's a, that's a terrific idea. And then we've got each of the individual exposure studies that would uh, be addressed. And I, just off the top of your head, what's the useful life of an exposure study? Is it 10 years? Is it five years? Or does it just vary dramatically from product to product? I think you're probably seeking some evidence of how frequently things are changing with particular products. Some probably change more rapidly than others. Yeah. Um, so I, I would have a hard time placing a specific amount of time, um, but you know the numbers you throw out might be plausible. And this is a this is an expenditure of almost a million dollars. And so uh, obviously you said we were going to be hiring a contractor to do the work for us. What specifically would the work be? that the contractor is doing. Presumably, we'll tell the contractor which product areas to study. So is the main uh, funding to develop the template? Is the main funding to do the data uh, research or to do the data analysis? What, what's that money being spent for? Yeah, I would say the majority of the cost, even in year one, is, is the data collection. However, in future years, I think a greater proportion becomes data collection because some of the other pieces of the investment that goes into the initial design and the initial clearance has already been born. Um, but I do anticipate, even with a, with a single-year authorization, that we, we would be able to collect data that would allow us to make some national estimates about some products. And one of the things we're always trying to decide between one approach or another approach is what do we spend the marginal dollar on? And so uh, can you tell me, uh, if you can sort of pull this from your memory, why would you spend the marginal dollar doing this, which will be a recurring cost, versus improving NICE? Uh, in more hospitals, more refined assessments, maybe more IDIs. Um, obviously, these are two competing considerations. Yeah, and in some ways you might be considering if you were spending more in epidemiology versus in other areas. And so it's not so much I, I'm saying this ought to come at the expense of something else we're doing with data, so much as I'm saying if we're, if we're moving to being more data-driven that perhaps we're making greater investments in this area, and this is one of the areas that we think would be useful. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense, and thank you again for an excellent presentation. Uh, I'm always impressed. Uh, what I'd like to do next is ask about the furniture tip-over project. And so I guess my first question, whoever is prepared to answer that, is we've just gotten this uh, bunch of data from Consumer Reports. They did this long article on furniture tip-over. And I guess I would be curious what if any uh, intention do we have with respect to incorporating the studies done by Consumer Reports, do we think that is information that's of high enough quality that we could take it into our analysis and maybe save ourselves some work? Or is, is you know, what would be the additional work beyond what uh, they've done that would, that would be useful in doing this furniture tip over project? Well, I, um, I think we would um, take a look at any data that we were given and, and reviewed. So um, I think that's starting from there. Uh, with regards to this specific study, um, you know, we had, the, we had the three different parts that are laid out here um, that we plan to use to um, inform uh, our work in both the voluntary standards and the mandatory standard that we're working towards. And I, let me be clear, I, I think gathering additional data, doing additional testing, especially engineering testing, is, a, is an excellent thing. I have to say I'm a bit skeptical about the need for focus groups to tell us something that I think we already know. But I guess my question is, how much of this, uh, is it 135,000, how much of this is dedicated to the focus group? How much of this is dedicated to doing the other, especially the engineering study? Uh, it's around half. Around a half? Okay. Um, and then on the subject of focus groups, um, I see that we are talking about doing a play yard mattress firm, firmness study and spending $110,000 on focus groups. And I'll just ask the question. I don't know. I'm sure there's a disagreement. But uh, first of all, isn't there enough academic literature on th these issues so that we don't need a focus group? And my follow-up question is, 
why can't we do focus group like this in-house? It doesn't seem to be a terribly complex challenge. Uh, and I guess my third question would be, uh, why can't we ask the folks at WPI to help us do the focus group? I'm sure they could do it for a lot less than $110,000. Those were um, three excellent questions um, uh, that is that we did not put forward before the commission right now. Um, I think as far as the academic literature, uh, we were we relied on uh, staff to put forward projects that they believed need to fill the gap. Um, they are aware of what is available or not. And um, and so I think that from a starting point, we felt like that was a lease necessary i think with regards to um, doing it ourselves um, there are some um, administrative costs and burdens uh, on the collection of data and some limits that that uh, we would have to follow with regards to that um, and uh, i think the third question was uh, going to a university that <laughs> yeah. uh, my my experience tells me we could go and give somebody a ten thousand dollar grant and they could probably do some good focus group work for us and i just don't understand why we need to spend one hundred and ten thousand hiring a contractor to do focus groups but maybe there's something there i'm missing well the um the contract would not preclude uh, a university from bidding on uh on any such work so i think that would be our approach if if that came out that way okay well i certainly appreciate that and these are not easily answered questions but they're easily raised questions and i, I appreciate your your response i guess my final question is with respect to the uh challenge.gov approach for uh pool drownings uh and i think i asked this and i have to admit i just forgot what part of the three hundred thousand dollars is going to be used as actual prize money if we go to challenge.gov and is there a reason we came up with pools, uh, which is an important and critical need, but we've got important and critical needs elsewhere that I would love to see some challenge money s set up for, furniture tip over being the one that I raised in years past, but if you could answer that, I'd appreciate it. Sure, good morning. Um, when it came to looking at challenge.gov, really the motivation was from the data, seeing how many hundreds of deaths we had with children drowning in pools every year, a pretty specific hazard pattern of child was in the house, suddenly, you know, gets gets out of the house, unobserved, falls in the pool, and is found, you know, sometime later. It's a specific hazard pattern that lends itself not easily to kind of what I would call our traditional approaches of go to the voluntary standard, you know, the usual tools we have in our toolbox. And the idea behind specifically pools and challenge.gov is how do we try and do something different? to try and solve this problem? And how do we create the incentive for some technological solutions, which we know are probably in some sort of nascent form, you know, needs to be put together? How do we create an incentive through crowdsourcing to get the public to really try and create what in our vision is a working prototype of something that sits, detects, and alarms of a child in or in, you know, that is near the pool or in the pool. And so that was really the motivation for staff putting together this specific challenge.gov on pools is just trying to do something different to solve this incredibly difficult, intractable problem that is killing hundreds of children a year. And where if we had even a small, you know, 1% change, you're talking about a whole number of lives saved. And there's very few products that we do that on. Uh, my time's uh, expired, but I still would like to know how much of this is actually going to be prize money, how much of the 300000 Sure. So uh, the way we've set this up, 150 k of it is research money looking at different sensor types, and 150 k of it would go towards the uh, contractor to set it up. Uh, the prize money was not part of that 150 k so zero on the actual prize money part. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. First of all, I want to thank all of you for the time you spent with me yesterday, and I have absolutely no question that over the next two weeks I will have additional questions as we work our way through this process. But it was very helpful to get answers to some of my preliminary questions yesterday. Um, I think it will t come as a surprise to no one who's watched me over the last five years that I'm not someone who's going to favor general surveys and focus groups without a very specific purpose and need that has a direct relationship with protecting consumers from a specific danger, such as we did with table saws and with ATVs. Table saws is a perfect example that I have trouble seeing how a general um, NCARES 
um, program would help us with that. We just needed to know with people who actually suffered injuries what kind of saws they were using. So um, I am having a little trouble with uh, this sort of general um, uh, surveys, focus groups, and giving out prizes. Um, we have such limited resources. But let me, let me say, um, first of all, with respect to the exposure and risk data analysis, and uh, Mr. Hanway, I want to thank you for our discussion yesterday, and I look forward to reading um, the academic articles you told me that you would get to me to help me perhaps understand this better. Um, we certainly have a lot of data gaps in this agency, and I would you know, I, urgent care facilities is the glaring, low-hanging fruit that we're doing absolutely nothing to address. Our saferproducts.gov um, is in dire need of updating, both with respect to reporting and making it something that consumers can actually use. Um, and I, as I told you yesterday, uh, Mr. Hanway, I'm going to get you um, a, a list of things for safer products that I'd like to see what kind of resources would be necessary in order to improve that um, it, incredibly important website that's important both for us in getting information and to consumers in, in getting more. Um, I do have a question for you, um, Mr. Ray, about portable generators. Um, the, you've asked for additional money for this project with NIST to assess uh, the ANSI, uh, the PGMA standard and the UL standards that have just been passed. Um, PGMA has repeatedly represented in press releases to members of Congress and to a number of other people that um, their standard does not require a reduction of CO and they've repeatedly um, represented that the CPSC has approved that they don't have to reduce um, CO and that their standard's 99% effective. If that's true, why do we need additional resources to study this further? Well, I would like to say we have not completed the evaluation of, of that standard. Um, and then the request that's before the commission is to um, evaluate the UL 2201, which um, at was there was a change in the approach they were taking after we had gotten the contract in place. So this additional money was to do additional testing related to that. Related, related to the UL standard? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still doing work on the PGMA that, standard. That's correct. We have not completed our evaluation. Okay. And um, at the priorities hearing, PGMA represented to us that they had given us data that um, allegedly supports their their repeated public representations of the effectiveness of their standard. Is that evaluation part of this request, or are we doing that now, I hope, um, separate uh, from this? We were doing this evaluation independent of the work that okay. they uh, presented. They did share that uh, with with us. So. Okay. Um, and... Um, Dr. Borlase, I, I do have a question for you with respect to the tip over request um, for $135,000. Um, you know, we've, we've watched over this last several years as we came up with a plan. We were purchasing dressers. We found that a number of the dressers um, did not meet the voluntary standard. Um, I know that Kids in Danger and Consumer Reports has also analyzed um, dressers and, and has, has um, found that they do not meet the, the, the voluntary standard as it exists now. And I guess I would also add that my staff and I have been um, intimately involved in watching, because we can't do anything else but watch in terms of the voluntary standard process because it looks like that's what we're going to get stuck with for the foreseeable future because we're not going to have a mandatory standard. So in watching that process, I do, as I'm reading this description, and I just want to make sure I understand, I certainly have uh, have been incredibly frustrated, as I'm, I assume staff has been as well, at the roadblocks being thrown up um, by industry to keep the voluntary standard from becoming stricter, even though by by all assessments of our staff and others, it's inadequate. Um, what, what is it that we're going to learn? Um, let's, I'm going to do this backwards. By buying more dressers, um, what are we going to learn? Because we've already gone out, we've bought dressers, we found noncompliant product, we started to recall them, 
when, and all of that got shut down approximately a year ago. And we haven't, I, I don't think we've been recalling any of the non-compliant product. So why are we purchasing more dressers? So in proposing the uh, purchasing and the testing of the dressers, we have a couple goals in mind coming out of EXHR. First uh, goal is to get a better sense uh, the this round of purchasing and testing is really to capture a wider uh, scope of the market. When we did the testing back in 2016, we had a very focused uh, segment. We were spe specifically looking for lighter dressers. This is supposed to be, uh, our plan here is to have a more representative sample of the dressers that are out there, um, looking you know, at a number of different manufacturers, types, et cetera. Uh, another goal of this is to see uh, not just the current stability, but to test them to see how much weight, for example, that they could uh, hand, hold under the current standard and then also evaluate as we're developing our performance requirements uh, under the NPR, what type of, uh, based on those performance requirements, how many dressers would meet the current standard, how many dressers would meet a new proposed standard to help assess what the change in the market would be based on any proposed requirements. Okay, well, I, I will talk to you further about this over okay. the next couple of weeks, but I have a real problem with why we, want, why we are concerned about dressers that are safe. What we're concerned about are dressers that are not safe, and I do know that these, and it's hard to call them anything other than games that industry's been playing about, you know, the outstops, which nobody, nobody uses on a dresser drawer, but in the last meeting, they were discussing whether if we put things in the drawer, whether they should be made of cotton or silk. I mean, they've just been throwing up all these roadblocks. And as I understood your answer yesterday, most of what you're asking for in this 135000 is to address these um, so-called concerns that industry's raising as roadblocks to the voluntary standard being improved. Is that fair to say? Um. It's not exclusively related to the voluntary standard. Uh, the request in here with the furniture tip over also is to inform the mandatory standard work that's been directed by the commission. So for the testing, as I mentioned, the questions that we're trying to answer there are questions we know we'll have to answer as part of the development of a proposed rule. The uh, other uh, questions related to the testing and the focus group are also born out of the technical work we're trying to do in the development of any possible uh, performance requirements. We're looking at tip over, we're looking at how children climb the furniture, what's the status of the furniture when the children are climbing it, for example, loaded versus unloaded. Um, so part of the question is, are there performance requirements we need to develop to reflect you know, the furniture when it, in its condition when the children are climbing it? And so the things that are in here that we're asking for specifically are requested to try and answer some of those questions. Okay, as I say, I'll, I'll talk to you further about this because I'm about to run out of time, but when we got the ANPR, all of these things that you're talking about that we're going to study f further, we're already, we're already in the package. So I'm not sure why we're spending years and years in, in this process that doesn't seem to be going anywhere, but we will talk further. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks to the staff for the package and for the uh, briefing and for answering the questions. Uh, you've answered all our questions to date, and I don't have any more questions at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kay. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, and I think... Okay, so we will go a second round for questions. Uh, Mr. Hanway, I'd like to call you back to the table if I could. Thank you. Without putting you between Commissioner Adler and myself, um, Commissioner Adler referred to nice versus necessary. And I want to kind of get your thoughts about this NCARES project and how necessary is it, how useful is it to this agency. And I thought you raised a good point that I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on. If we are going to be a data-driven agency, um, how would this assist us in that endeavor? Yeah, I think we're um, frequently called upon to answer very specific questions. Some of those we have data at our disposal that can help us answer those questions. Sometimes that's not available to us. This is just an area that we, we feel like we're frequently at a deficit to provide answers um, that would be useful. And uh, so, so the idea is just to put ourselves in a position to be ready to answer those questions as they come before the commission. 
Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Borles, if I could ask you to take the seat. Uh, if you could um, and wouldn't mind, would you talk to us a little bit about focus groups, why they are in, why staff believes they have uh, an important role in what we do in informing this agency, why they were put into the mid-year plan? And I recognize that for focus groups, they've shown up a couple times in each of the projects. Um, I will say that as staff developed the projects, um, it was project by project in terms of what questions we have and what we need that focus groups came in. The reasons focus groups show up in a couple of these is because as we're working on these projects, we're reaching a point where we have questions related to the consumer behavior and the consumer interaction with the product that we're trying to get answers to. We went to focus groups uh, because we have a specific set of questions that we're trying to answer we, in a shorter amount of time than, say, what you see in a national survey. So kind of to draw a distinction, um, we're looking at uh, you know, a smaller group of people that we can get questions or answers from in a shorter amount of time. But we still feel at the end there are these questions related to consumers and interacting with the products. And we felt the best way for those specific projects is to do focus groups. And that's why we proposed that to the commission. Thank you. Those are the questions I have for now, Commissioner Adler. Um, I'm not about to put staff in the middle of an ongoing debate because some of the issues regarding uh, this additional uh, research are legal questions. And um, so, and that's something we need to sit down and talk to our attorneys about. But I still maintain that a lot of what I'm hearing discussed today is what I call fits into the realm of, that'd be nifty to know. That would be nice to know. But I don't know that it's necessary to know. And we are a data-driven agency, but we are not driven to the point of distraction uh, by data in the sense that we uh, can always do additional work, and it would always be fun to do that and useful. But then you do get into paralysis by analysis, and every day that you're spent spending studying something uh, may be a day that you're not actually protecting people, and that's the ongoing uh, debate that we have. Uh, and we're not going to resolve that now, but I appreciate uh, Commissioner Burkle uh, raising it as an issue. Um, and I guess one just last comment is that uh, it is useful to know about consumer behavior, but the ongoing test of consumer behavior in many respects is the bottom line, are people being injured or are they being killed? If they're being injured and killed, that may be what we need to know. Uh, if you look at Section 9, Section 9 does not require a lot of this elaborate consumer behavior study, and, and you know, there's language there that you can interpret both ways, but my, my basic uh, sense, especially from having observed this agency over 40 years, is that if you've got good injury data, you've got good fatality data, you've got good IDIs, and you've got good market data, there isn't really a lot more that you need to know, and again, every day you're spending not helping people uh, and just studying it as a day that people are at risk. That said, I'd like to uh, uh, ask a question about ATVs, and I just comment that back in the day when I left the commission, back in aught 84, we were immersed in doing ATVs, and when I came back, guess what? We're still working on ATVs, and nine years later, we're still working on them. It's a very complex and important and dangerous product. But my specific question has to do with the rollover protection devices. And I see that staff is proposing that we do some very careful study of these rollover protection devices. Now, my best memory tells me that when the folks from Australia came to us and talked about these rollover protection devices, staff was pretty skeptical about them. Uh, and I guess my question is, have we, on the basis of additional data coming in from Australia, decided that that really is something worth uh, looking at? And is, does that hold out promise for reducing injuries? So um, staff's aware of the work that Australia has been doing on the rollover protection. And what we have in here is not specifically driven just by the Australia data, but from the plan that we've had for the last couple of years in terms of trying to evaluate uh, ATV stability um, in executing that plan. 
Uh, we've gone through uh, other and published the reports that we've done on the technical work with our contractor on ATVs and ATV rollovers, and we're at the point now to evaluate rollover protection systems, and that's really why it's now in here at the mid-year. No, I think that's very useful. I'll just say that when I first met the, uh, the Australian guys, I got very excited about it. I went running to staff, and they said, nah, <laughs> it won't work, and there are a million reasons that they said it, not only would it not work, but it might make them more dangerous, and so I'm glad to see that we're actually looking at it. I have no idea what the answer is, but I'm really delighted that staff is is focusing on that. And those are the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. I would just like to say that um, this, this phrase of data-driven agency gets thrown around pretty loosely and pretty, um, uh, it's in a misleading way many times. We have data tools here at the agency that are tried and true. NICE is an example. Saferproducts.gov is an example. They are in urgent, urgent need of updating. There is absolutely nothing in this plan to use this, um, to use the, to, to find ways of improving these data tools that we know we have. And instead what's being proposed is a brand new one that's sort of a general amorphous NCARE is a very, um, a nice name, but but there's there's no way in which this is going would in any way come close to what is needed in terms of updating SeferProducts.gov and um, improving the Nice system, including getting information which we are completely without, 100% lacking any information from urgent care facilities, which um, surveys and uh, have shown repeatedly is a, a place where people are going um, much more frequently than emergency departments now. We have no data whatsoever. But instead, the proposal is that we will um, form a whole new amorphous creature that who knows how it's going to be used. Um, I have nothing further. Commissioner Kay? No more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I. I'd like to just, if I could, piggyback on Commissioner Robinson's question, and that is, is this a new project, this NCARES project? Well, we've done exposure surveys in the past, most recently with the uh, nursery product exposure survey. What's new about this is the attempt to try and, uh, you know, create a, a uh, process and be able to put together a couple of these and gain some efficiencies when we do the exposure surveys. By doing a number of exposure surveys at once, that will save us money, and then by having a pre-approved OMB process, save us then time when we do them. So doing exposure surveys is not new. We have done them before at the agency. What is new about this is trying to gain some efficiencies in money and time by putting them together under what we're calling the NCARES program. Thank you. Um, I also want to just follow up on the ATV questions. Um, there are two projects in this mid-year proposed by staff, um, the occupant protection to evaluate what's in the marketplace now, and then the second one to develop and evaluate a proof of concept device. So I'd like to have you speak a little bit about if there is a correct order in those projects, what it would be, what makes sense for this agency to do. Uh, th the way we've proposed it and prioritized it is the correct order to do it. The first request, which is under number 2.5, um, is the request of what is currently out there. 2.7 is based on the results of 2.5. So uh, in order, you have to do 2.5 before you can do 2.7. We have them both in there um, in that should the funding be available, we could kind of forward fund 2.7, if you will. But to be clear, you have to do 2.5 first. Thank you very much. Commissioner Adler? Uh, no further questions. Again, thank you for a really excellent presentation and uh, an excellent document. Commissioner Robinson? Just a follow-up question, Dr. Borlase. I I've been here for five years, and if I'm remembering correctly, we've had one, maybe two exposure surveys we've done in that time. I know we're, we're still doing, right, ATVs? Uh, it was proposed, and we didn't do it? That had been previously proposed, but we did not receive funding for it. The uh, national... Uh, Durable Nursery Product Exposure Survey was the, probably the most recent one we've done. Okay, and can you tell me any other one you've done other than durable nursery products? That's the most recent one we've done. When you say most recent, though, that's the only one I recall in five years. That, that may fair? be about correct, yes. Commissioner Kay? Nothing, thanks. So I think that that ends our rounds of question from the commission. Having heard for no further questions, I again want to thank staff for being here this morning 
and all, again, uh, behind the scenes who played a role in developing this 2018 mid-year um, plan. I also want to thank Congress and the administration for working to provide this increased funding as a part of our FY 2018 omnibus bill. It's because of those additional funds that we have additional funding available this year. I'm grateful for what we received so we can fund these important safety products, however the Commission decides to move forward. At this time, we will conclude this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission, and I thank all of you.